this job is now a piece of cake, Claire. But then... Yeah, I'll tell you something, partner. I just might stick around a few more years. But then... No more dashboard du jour or Vince under glass, huh? But then... Look out! <laughs> Even with airbags, Vince, you still got to remember to buckle your safety belt. Now you tell me. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. Hit them out because they would just, the, the little thing sticking up would just hit you in the hip so you'd stuck them, stick them in the seats right there so they wouldn't be a bother. You remember vinyl seats to where if you were a kid back there playing with your toy, you'd just be sliding around as they took curves. You know, you'd just be sliding in that, that back seat. I can remember, this would have probably been in 1968 or 69, when you crawled up, when I would crawl up in the back window, in the little shelf in the back window, and the sun would come through, and it would feel so good and just, just bake on you a little bit, and it would just feel good. Because Americans didn't wear seatbelts. Americans weren't into seatbelts. It was a bother. And in the... Early 1980s, the National Transportation Board introduced two dummies to us, Vince and Larry. And they had been using dummies to figure out what the impact was or, or what the results were of car wrecks. They used to use cadavers. They would, they, they would use them, but they, they ended up putting monitors and sensors on these dummies, and then they'd run them into walls, and they would crash them and everything. And somebody got the bright idea, well, well why don't we just make an ad campaign? Well, the ad campaign, if you were a little kid then, you knew Vince and Larry. In fact, it became a full-on slot of Vince and Larry. Fox came out with a, a TV show, Sunday, uh, Saturday morning TV show with Vince and Larry. I had to buy some Vince and Larry things for my little boys because they would play with them at other people's houses. We need Vince and Larry. We need Vince and Larry, you know. Because there's some, especially with little boys, taking Vince and Larry and just throwing them into the wall and things like that. You could learn a lot from a dummy. It, it's really quite amazing the different places we can learn things from. And in this series, we've been talking about learning things, learning things about God, learning things about ourselves, from different pictures, as it were. Uh, we've been talking about the parables and the stories, and, and sometimes it's so clear to see what someone else should do and miss what you should do. That was our first parable, where Nathan confronts David. And he asked him for some little advice, and he gave some very harsh but correct advice, and Nathan said, this is all about you, big boy. Last week, we looked at a, a parable. And with that parable, I mean, with that, that fable, it was a fable, we looked at the trees and the trees selecting a king, and it gives us lessons, lessons we can hang on to. But I believe that besides the special revelation God's given us in His book, both the left side and the right side. He's given us a picture book in general revelation. He's given us a big picture book in which we can learn from. To, to show you how effective Vince and Larry were, those dummies, in 1983, 14% of Americans wore seatbelts. 14%. In 2017, the last year I could find records, uh, there were 89.7%. 89.7% of Americans wore seat belts in their car. Even though we've gotten airbags and all those other, other devices. To show you that jump, in 1987, so in 1983 we had 14%. In 1987, Larry and Vince have been doing their thing on the, on the small screen. It jumped up to 42%, from 14% to 42%. Evidently, America learned a lot from those dummies. And we continue to learn from the impact of those dummies. Because if, if you came of age during the, the 80s and 90s, you remember these. The impact of these, that they, that it, it just 
it grabbed you at a place to where it becomes automatic now. I remember the reason I was about buckling my seatbelt is because they made it a law. You could get a ticket, you know. So, but after about 30 days, it just became automatic to do that. God has a picture book, and that picture book we can learn from, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. And I've titled this Great Wisdom from Small Creatures. Great Wisdom from Small Creatures. This is not a parable, but it's a picture book. You open up, and, and there's, a, there's a picture book. And God gives us a picture book. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is written so that we can attain wisdom. It's as a, as a father wants to make sure that his children understand and know wisdom. And so you don't have to face and struggle with the things that I had to face and struggle with. And so um, most of these Proverbs were written by Solomon. Solomon was uh, David's son who asked for wisdom. And, but this one we're reading today is written by a guy named Agor. And, and Agor wrote just the Proverbs that were written in chapter 30. So Proverbs chapter 30. And he goes through this thing and these sayings and he'll say, for, for three, this will happen. Yea, for four. And he does a, he puts a number three or number two and then he'll add one to it. But he does something different when he comes down to verse 24. And he says, these are four things. And he shows us four creatures, four pictures that he wants us to look at. And let's begin. Four things on the earth are small yet they are extremely wise. So he is talking about these small creatures, creatures that you would pass by every day and miss the lesson they're trying to teach. And it's very interesting here, uh, in, the, in the Greek translation of this, where it says extremely wise, it says wise beyond wise. It uses the word Twice wise. Wise above and beyond wise. So these four creatures, these four little animals, two of them are insects, one of them's a rep reptile and one of them's a, a mammal, these four insects can teach you and me a lot about God, about ourselves, about our propensity. And so he's encouraging that the reader of Proverbs goes through and he learned the lessons of life. Let's look at what he says in the first one. The first one he says, ants. You know, ants. <laughs> Crawling everywhere. Ants are creatures of little strength. And yet they store up their food in the summer. Ants are, are, are creatures that crawl. In fact, it says ants are people or nations <laughs> is, is the way it is listed. Ants are creatures that, that crawl and we never give them the time of day. We never ask them if they're so small, how can they survive in such a hostile world? What do ants know that we don't know? And he says, ants are creatures, and he'll use this word yet. Yet. In contrast. In contrast to their size, they do something. They act in a way. All of these animals act in a way that ensure their longevity. That ensure their existence. And he says, they store up their food in the summer. Ants have a thing about time. They have a thing about seasons. They, they understand seasons. They understand that there are good seasons and bad seasons. They understand there are, that, that there are times when you can act in times when that action of acting will be taken away from you. They understand because they've looked back at history of their lives. And they understand that while there was a time in history when we didn't have the winter, here's the summer and we have a chance to do something and so we will work. And we'll work all through this summer. And we won't be lazy. In fact, I don't have the verse up here, but in Proverbs chapter 10, uh, Solomon will write about a son and he'll say, hey, it's, it's a son who uh, works in the summer and takes advantage of the opportunity that is prosperous and yet the son that is lazy in the summer ends up suffering defeat or being put set aside. The ant knows what time it is. It knows that there are times and opportunities when it can act and gather food because there's time in the future that's coming 
when it will not be able to act. The ant knows this. And, and that might seem simple, but the fact of the matter is a lot of us don't know that. A lot of human beings don't know this. A, a lot of human beings live without any thought to history at all. They, and you know, that's been said, if we don't learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat those lessons in the future. Not an ant. Only humans. And so uh, there are people that either live in the past and they stay in the past, or people that live in the future and they stay in the future, and they don't act right now in the ways that the opportunities that are in front of them will allow them to act. They wait. The ant takes the past and acts on it in the present to prepare for the future. The ant acts in a way because he knows the future's coming. The, uh, I was meeting with a, a friend of mine who's a financial advisor. And, um, you know, it's, the, the financial thing, uh, it's like Gene Wolfe once told me. He says, right, you just don't care anything about money. You know, I care about what money can do, but I just don't... Money's not just a, being beat into my head. And I was talking to this financial advisor, and uh, we, were, we, were, we were talking about, you know, being more effective with my retirement and everything. And he and I have the same eschatological view. We, we have the same view of a future thing. And I told him, I said, but, you know, I, I think we're not too far away from the rapture. And, and his comeback, he says, but that's not a retirement plan. And I said, okay, you got me. He said, let's let, because, you know, and he agreed with me, he said, but, but let's let God take care of that. And, and, and you and I prepare and do what we need to do with what we have right now. You know what he was telling me? You need to act like an ant. You need to act like an ant. Be, because you saw your dad retire. You saw your grandfather retire. And yet there, there are people that think, I'm just going to keep working. I'm just going to keep working. And what are you going to try on? I don't know. Maybe Social Security. I don't know. That's in the area of, of planning. But they're, they're in the area of finances, but there are other, the other areas. And Hagar says, you need to learn the wisdom of an ant. An ant knows what time it is. An ant knows what season of life. And he, and he looks at those opportunities and he grabs those opportunities. He takes advantage of those opportunities when it's before him. Because he knows down the road, things are going to change. And those opportunities will be gone. Learn the lesson of the ant. In the next verse, you might have different words here. I've put in conies instead of the hyrex that the NIV has. This is the NIV translation. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags or in the, in the rock. Uh, some of your, your translations might have rock badgers. Actually, when we were at Chorazim, we saw this creature. Some of your translations might have rabbits. They ain't rabbits. It's a little fur ball, uh, about just a little bit bigger than a squirrel. And we were at Chorazim, and Chorazim was one of those cities that Jesus pronounced a curse. Woe to you, Chorazim and Bethsaida. He was, he was pronouncing, if, if, if what had been done before you would have been done at Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have been saved. Because they would have turned and repented, and you haven't done that. And we were in that city, among those walls, and I'm seeing this little brown fur. There's a little picture of that that fuzzball, and, and he just crawls along the rocks. And I said, they're cute, but then I've seen, you know, that movie with Steven Spielberg with, Spielberg with the little stuffed toy in there that, you know, so I wasn't going to go around him and try to chase him down. But these things just, just run right along top of the rocks, and they stop and they look at you, and then they just keep right on, right on walking. They're, they're everywhere. They're, and, and, and what I am told, because I didn't handle one, is their body's not that big, they got all this hair that makes them look bigger. But he says they make their home in the rock, among the rock. 
They know where their security is, where their security lies. It lies among the rock. These animals don't go out and burrow a, a hole. It, they, they don't go out and dig in the ground. Their little feet have these uh, uh, little suctions where they can grab rocks. And one of the things I read says, trying to get at them, an animal trying to get at them will have to tear a whole mountain apart to get at them. They are able to slide in that rock, to get in that crevice, and sit back and say, nana, nana, boo, boo, you can't get me, you know. Because they know where their safety is. They know where their security is. It's in the rock. That's where they're secure. That's where they're protected. They don't tell themselves, I'll be protected out in this field, or I'll be protected up in that tree. They don't tell themselves that. They know where their security lies, and their security lies in the rock. And yet, too many people live their lives not understanding and not knowing and not being aware of the fact that their security is in the rock. Uh, they base their security in other things, in other places. God says He was a rock for us. And if we would hide ourselves in Him, we would be secure. The question would be, for the person looking at the ant, do you know what time it is in your life? The question for the person looking at the coney would be, do you know where your security is? Do you know where your safety is? What are you thinking that's going to protect you? Shield yourself in the rock. There's a third insect that he talks about here. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. This is very interesting. As I was reading about this, you cannot tell a locust from a grasshopper. They look, they look the same. In fact, one of the articles I read says this, that depending on the conditions, and this usually happens in eastern Africa, it will be very, very dry, and then all of a sudden you'll have a wet season. And these grasshoppers will end up multiplying because of the conditions, the environment they multiply in. And then it's like a switch turns on. A switch turns on to where they can communicate and connect with each other. Before then, they're not really interested in each other. They're just jumping along and flying along their own ways, caring for their own selves. But when that switch is flipped in their brain, two things happen. Number one, they change colors. They transform in their, in their color. The second thing that happens is they are able to connect and communicate. And locusts, individually, they can be squashed. Nothing happened. They're annoyance. But when they get together, they can bring an entire nation to its knees. They can, they can swarm over and eat in a day the food that, at least from what I read, would end up feeding 35,000 people together. Um, one of the things, uh, the reason for this article was, this year, in July of 2020, they were looking at, this was a year with a lot of rain. And the alert was out, wait a minute, what do we do? Do we spray? What, what do we do? Because this whole locust thing could really hit us now. I mean, why not with everything else that's hit us? <laughs> And they've even moved, uh, I believe it was 1998, it might have been in the early 2000s, they moved from Africa over to South America so they can fly a great distance. But they do that together. What the locusts teach us is that there's strength together. That, that we need each other. There's things that we can do together that we would never be able to do individually. And Agar tells his reader, look in God's picture book. Look and see and learn that not only what time it is and not only where your security lies, but look and see what you can do together. What community looks like. Why would you want to be a lone ranger? I have so many people that tell me, you know, hey, I'm a, a Christian. Uh, I 
trusted Christ when I was a, a kid. My parents made me go to church because they thought it was either church or prison. But I haven't, you know, prison's out of my, I'm not going there and I don't need church. And they end up isolating themselves and not becoming all that they could be. Because we can do great things when we're together. There are things that you know that I don't know. There's not anything that I know that Gail doesn't know. But besides that, there are things that we can help each other with and we can encourage each other with. Look at the locusts. They advance in ranks. They advance in divisions that, that together they move forth. They are a force that the world will have to reckon with. There's a, a fourth animal here. If the ant teaches us to know what time it is, where we are, what season of life we're in, and how to act on that, if the coney tells us where to find our security, if the locust tells us to, to get together and, and understand the power of community, the lizard tells us that some things just don't look right. So, some things don't make sense. He says, a lizard can be caught with the hand. You can run around. An eighth grade boy can do that, by the way. Not a 59-year-old man, but an eighth grade boy can do that. And you can catch a lizard with your hand. And yet, you can find them in king's palaces. Now, I don't live in a king's palace, but there are things that I was thinking about, oh, about just a couple of months ago, but I've been thinking about it more and more. And this week I thought about it because of this verse. There are things called skinks. And I think that the skinks have opened a resort at my home. I mean, I'm looking and those things run out in front of me and I jump that high, you know, it just... They're everywhere. And I wonder, how much did those skinks pay? How much do they... Pay? What's their share of the property tax? What, what? They just enjoy themselves... And they'll just be sitting there and you can see out the side of their head where they're breathing. You know, their blood's pumping or something. They're, they're, they're just there and they're making themselves at home. And those suckers get big. If we ever got real hungry, you know, who knows? But those suckers are big and, and they're just all over that. Mine's not a king's palace, but Agar is saying, hey, even in a king's palace, a king's show place, you can find these these lizards. Now, some of your translations, the King James says spider. And most people agree that, 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 it's, that it's the lizard. Lizards, the way that its little legs and feet were designed were like suction cups where they can be up on the wall and you're sitting there and just looking on the wall and there would be a, a lizard. It, it's, it's out of place, but it makes its home in a king's palace. It doesn't, it looks, it looks odd because why would it be there? And I think that what the lizard tells us is about grace. About grace. Sometimes you and I end up thinking about the goodness of God. And we say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be here. I'm so out of place. Look at my past, what I've done. Why would I be here? And Agar would say, just as a lizard, doesn't make sense for it to be in a king's palace, but it is. We end up finding ourselves as part of God's family and living in God's presence and promised that we will be one day in God's house. Agar is giving us a, a lot of wisdom here. He says this is wiser than the wisest. This is the wisdom that's above wisdom. Because although these four creatures are simple, people miss it. They live outside of their time, not for the moment they're given. They try to find security and shelter in a place that doesn't offer it. And, and they tell themselves, well, it'll be different for me. 
they end up trying to do it alone and they miss the impact they could have on the world and the world have on them by doing things together, by being part of a community. And they end up feeding themselves the idea that they should not be experiencing the grace and goodness of a God that loves them. But they should. So these are what Agar would say great wisdom from these small creatures. And I have these questions here. This morning Lee sang one thing. The one thing. The one thing. Because what these creatures have in common is they all do one thing really well. And the one thing saves their hide. The one thing. Find out what God has equipped you to do and do it. You might, might not be a giant. <laughs> but you need to remember that winter's coming. And that winter could be your health. That winter could be your opportunities. Winter's coming. Prepare for winter. You know, uh, when we had the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, where people would go along, $20 for a roll of toilet paper, you know. People walking along with their coats and, hey, I've got the good stuff here. And it was, you know, like double rolled, two-ply. I walked in my garage and I looked up and I said, there's a lot of toilet paper in this place. I could probably get fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for the toilet paper in this place. Because I knew that it wouldn't go bad. This toilet paper had gone bad. Smell it. It's has gone bad. Whenever it was on sale, it's $2 off. I'm grabbing it. I'm grabbing it. Gail said, we don't need no more toilet paper. You got it sitting in our bed right here. You don't need more toilet paper. And then the great toilet paper shortage of 2020 hit. I didn't know it was coming. But we had it. So you might not be a giant, but you can prepare for winter. You might not be a great fighter, a great warrior. But you can hide yourself. You can understand the security that God has. You can hide yourself in the rock. You might not be the person out front as the leader, but you can band together and encourage each other as a community of faith and move forward. And the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against that movement. Oh, if, if the church ever got together, if we ever got together under the banner of the Lord, black and white and brown and Asian, and we, if we ever got together, whew, if we ever got together the ones that speak in tongues and the ones that, are, that, that don't, whew, what we could do for Jesus. The ones with the collars and the ones that, that, that wear the golf shirts. The ones with the funny hats and the ones that don't wear hats. The ones that kneel and the ones that, the ones that wear the jewelry and the ones that cross. and the one. If we ever got together, whoo, watch out. You might not be a king, but you can live in the king's palace. He said, I left to prepare a place for you. And I prepared it for you. And and you're not going to look out of place there. Because you're going to have saved by grace. It's going to be very clear. Wow, this is for you. And you might feel like you're out of place, but it was made for you. Four lessons. Four small creatures. The amount of wisdom that God has displayed all around us is amazing. We just need to tune in to that wisdom and understand, know, and learn that. Let's pray. Father, I thank You that You teach us the lessons through Your Word, very practical lessons. And through these creatures, those small, You teach us that they all know one thing. They all find themselves in one place. Father, may we gather the wisdom of these creatures and make decisions based on that wisdom. 
May we act in a way that shows our understanding of Your watchful care for us as You have for them. May we seek to take steps to walk in a way that reflects Your goodness and Your grace in our lives this and every day. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.